and educating ourselves to what these things mean. Job 38, 33, where it says, God is saying to Job, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? The Pleiades is one of the um, constellations in the heavens. And so here God is saying, can you bind the uh, chains of the Pleiades? Can you lead forth the constellations in their seasons? And then it says in 33, do you know the ordinances of heaven? The ordinances simply means a decree or a law, a directive. It's the law to understand. So God is asking Job, do you understand the laws that govern the heavens? I'm asking the same question today. First of all, in order to know the ordinances of heaven, you must know the most important part or feature of the laws of heaven. The word in the Bible is Maseroth, the ordinances of heaven. If you go to Job 38, 32, you will see the word Maseroth. And in the footnotes, it says the signs of the zodiac. Now, a lot of people think that the zodiac should not be connected to Christianity or the Bible at all. Actually, in point of fact, the zodiac is the basis for both Old and New Testament. When you consult Bible references like the Bible dictionaries and encyclopedias, you look up the word Maserat and will tell you it's the 12 signs of the zodiac. We are given to understand in the Bible that God created the zodiac. And that may sound strange to a lot of people because most people think of the zodiac as something evil, especially in Christianity. But no, the zodiac is the basis for much of our learning today, much of our symbolism today, especially in religion and politics. I mean, even the watch you wear uh, is 12 signs of the zodiac or the 12 signs that go in a circle. And that's what the word zodiac means, the 12 signs. We talk about the kingdom of God all the time, but most people don't realize what the kingdom really is. We humans put uh, different life forms into different uh, categories. We say fish are in schools and cattle are in herds. What kind of life form do we humans say are in a kingdom, if it isn't animals, animal kingdom. The Greeks came up with uh, the idea that the zodiac was a kingdom of animals that circled the earth. And so when we say in our prayers, even in the uh, Roman system that gave us a lot of our understanding of the zodiac today, we say in our prayers, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, let thy kingdom come, and let thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. We are living our lives in the zodiac. All cultures in the world recognize that the zodiac is important in their theology and their belief systems. And when you go to uh, Bible bookstores or Bible seminaries, go into the large libraries, and you will begin to see that there are so many books that are written by Christian and Jewish theologians and people who study religions. Uh, Wycliffe Bible Commentary talks about to qualify as a director and judge of man's life on earth, one must be able to govern the heavenly bodies that rule the earth. Note the repeated mention of the influence of the atmospheric or astral heavens on earthly affairs. We're talking astrology. Here in the New Interpreter's Bible, it says uh, some connection between what happens in the heavens and what happens on earth is presupposed in the question that Job is being asked by God if he knows the ordinances of heaven. Being asked that question obviously means that God has assigned uh, ordinances in heaven, and we're calling it the Zodiac, Maserat. Let's go back to Genesis 1.14 while we're on this subject. 
And then Genesis, the first book of the Bible, the first page says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs. Another Bible translation says, and God said, let there be light holders in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from night and let them be for signs. The word signs means things to come in Hebrew. The word for signs, the word is oth, O-T-H. This is a Hebrew word which is translated in the Bible as just things to come. Well, that's what the Zodiac uh, purports to do. It tells you about things to come. All Christians are aware that Jesus says to his apostles that in my father's house are many mansions. Dictators and, and kings have always felt that there's a mansion in heaven for them. Well, it's a misunderstanding. The incorrect way is to say, in my father's house are many mansions. But other translations say, in my father's house are many abodes. Abodes is where you live, where you are is in your abode. In my father's abode are many dwelling places. Oh, now we're getting to it because the heavens is where God is. And if God is in heaven, the scripture says that in my father's abode are many houses, are many resting places for the sun, houses of the zodiac. Basically, it boils down to this, that both the Old and New Testament are based on astrology. The 12 signs of the zodiac is, is part of the number 12 in Christianity. There were 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 brothers of Joseph, the 12 breastplate stones on the high priest, and then the 12 apostles. Look in the Bible and you will see how many times 12 is used. It's all based on the 12 signs of the zodiac. There was no 12 tribes of Israel. Each one of those signs in the 12 tribes of Israel was an astrological indicator as to what each month represented in the ancient Jewish religion. And the ancient Jewish religion understood this. It's people today who are not studying theology do not understand that the whole of the Old and New Testament is a metaphor. HarperCollins Study Dictionary says the Lord made the constellations of Pleiades and Orion. I don't know how one could read something like this and not see that the Bible is saying God made the constellations of the Zodiac. New International Bible says he, God, is the maker of the bear and Orion and the Pleiades and the constellations of the South. So if you want to find a fault with astrology, then you're finding fault with the ideas and concepts that God has put into the heavens as laws. Many philosophers have talked about that foolish people, ignorant and foolish people, are dominated by the zodiac. They don't know that their personalities and things that happen to them are because of the stars and the moon and the, and the influence of these heavenly signs but that the wise people are guided uh, by the sign. And so I, it occurred to me that, that for thousands of years, mankind has navigated around the world on the high seas by a knowledge of the stars. And so the Bible is saying you should navigate your life by the stars. Here we have a typical publication in Christianity talking about astrology as satanic. And that's why I'm spending so much time talking about the biblical reference works, saying that no, it is created by God. It's not satanic. If you really are interested in theological and spiritual subjects, especially in relation to the Bible, you need to get the Companion Bible by Kriegel, because it's an astounding work, where it gives one half of the page is the, is the scripture. The other half of, the, of each page are the footnotes. And the footnotes will actually blow you away, because it tells you the truth about what these symbols really mean and where they came from. In the back of the uh, Kriegel Bible, 
it talks about the word and where it came from in the Hebrew and what it means. And it, it basically is saying that it is uh, telling you about things to come, astrology. On this episode, I'd like to talk a little bit about the sun and its symbolic importance in the whole story of the zodiac. Now, as we begin the story of the sun and the ancient religions of the world and how much the sun has dominated civilization for as long as we have records, we need to go back to the very beginning. And that's a long time ago. Let's go back to Egypt. We'll start in Egypt because that's one of the oldest civilizations on the earth. And we will see how Egypt developed the concept of the importance of the sun in relation to theology and spirituality and religion. Now this is an ancient symbol for the sun, prehistoric, that the ancient peoples drew to represent the sun. It's an equal arm cross within the circle. Here is an artifact that was found in England, its own hinge. It's on a golden circle, which represents the sun. And then you'll see the cross in between. And this is about 4,500 years old. Almost 5,000 years ago, ancient mankind drew pictures of what they perceived the sun to be as an equal arm cross. And you will see it also in the ancient religions of the Near and Middle East the different ancient gods in the Phoenician, Canaanite, Sumerian systems, they all had the equal arm cross. But it's important to remember that the sun was never perceived as a god. It was perceived to represent the spiritual qualities of God in that it brought life to the earth, it brought warmth to the earth, it brought energy for us to live. So all of the good things about God and his creation was best represented by the symbol of the sun. Sometimes the sun actually even looks like it has an equal arm cross in the heavens. You will find the equal arm cross all over the world. Every race and creed and color has the same symbol for the ancient sun. The Nordics had the symbol, the Vikings kept the symbol, ancient France used the symbol. The symbol was on rocks and carvings and paintings. Even in India, you have the equal arm cross. The Celtic and the Celtic Druids in Europe and England and Ireland had an equal arm cross. Native Americans used it, Central America, and especially in Mayan and Inca and some of the ancient uh, religions in South America have used the equal arm cross. So it became known all around the world that the equal arm cross within a circle represented the old 5,000 year old petroglyph concept of the sun. Today people see it everywhere and so it has become not really important because it's just a general symbol that people realize is a cross. Here is a picture of the ancient Nordic peoples that were preparing for what we would call today the Easter sunrise service. The circle on the cross is not a man dying on a cross, it's the sun on the north, east, west, and southern parts of the earth. That's the whole story in itself, is the vision of the sun going southward and dying on the cross and then being reborn on December 25th when it moves one degree northward and now is coming back and sort of springing back to life. And so on the, in the spring, we call it springing back to life. But here are Christians gathering to worship Jesus, never realizing that they are actually meeting around a very ancient symbol of the old petroglyph cross. That this symbol of an equal arm cross within the circle represents an old ancient idea of how to picture the sun. 
And it's really extraordinary to, to notice that all churches use that same symbol. And all over the world, people do not realize that this cross that they think represents Christianity is actually for over 5,000 years old. It's an ancient, prehistoric symbol of the sun. Jesus has always represented the sun, the S-U-N, not S-O-N. The etymology of the word for the sun, you see that sun can be S-U-N or S-O-N, and depending on how it's used. S-O-N and S-U-N are used interchangeably in Christianity. Today we still have Jesus as God's son in the heavens, and he became now a great sun god. But the question you need to ask yourself is, who owns the sun? You will assume that the sun must be owned by someone. Well, mankind doesn't own the sun. If anything, you would say maybe God owns the sun. So if God owns the sun, then it's God's sun, and he's the light of the world. Of course the sun is the light of the world. As in the southern constellation, when you go down south, when the sun reaches the lowest part in the sky in southern hemisphere, there is a constellation of stars that look just exactly like a uh, cross. And so we say the sun, when it dies in December, it goes down and dies on the cross. The cross is called the southern cross. When he was dead, but now he's coming back to the northern hemisphere because he promised he would return. And he is returning again in the spring. Solar symbolism of the sun going southward each, uh, each day until it finally reaches uh, December 22nd when it's, it's its lowest point in the southern sky. It's down south now. It's gone south. But on December 22nd, the sun goes as far in the south as it's going to go, and it stops going southward on December 22nd. It doesn't go any further southward. Then on the 23rd and 24th, it rises on the same degree. And therefore, for three days, it doesn't move at all, it stays in that same degree. So we say, and the ancient people said, that Jesus, or God's Son, died for three days. Why? Because it was moving every day, and now it's not moving for three days. So for three days, the sun was dead, and on December 25th, the sun moves one degree northward, which indicates, our, our, and even the United States Navy will show you on their instruments, that it indicates the sun is now alive again. He's born again. Now he's going to work his way back to the northern hemisphere. Because he said, God's son said, I will, I will return. Well, he does. He returns every year. So what do you see? Do you see a man on this cross? Do you see a man dying on the cross? No. This is what is actually meant by dying on the cross. It's the sun. During the summer, when the sun is in the northern hemisphere, it is in the constellation of Leo, so he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then when he dies, he dies in Capricorn down south when he goes south. And so now he dies in the winter. And then he comes back and springs back to life. And when he comes back to the northern hemisphere, we call it spring. But when it crosses the equator, the sun will have to cross the equator coming back to us in the north. When it crosses the equator, it is said to have passed over the equator. So in the Hebrew religion, when the sun passes over the, the, the coming back to the northern hemisphere, they call that celebration the Passover. But for Christians, they're worshiping the sun also as it passes over, but they refer to it as the resurrection. God's son has been resurrected. He's come back. 
Here we have 37 of what we call sons of God from the ancient world to the modern. And they all have the same identity and the same stories that go with their lives. They were born of a virgin. They, they died on a cross. They were dead for three days and then was resurrected and came back. Their, their father was a carpenter and they had 12, almost all of these had 12 followers or 12 apostles. They had the same story that we have in Christianity 37 times over. So it's a continuation of the same story coming out of the ancient world, and today we call it Catholicism or Christianity. The reason why these themes keep repeating themselves is because it is what is called the greatest story ever told. I think it is the greatest story ever told that the son is born each morning and ultimately dies at night and then emerges the next morning and bring life back again, but then dies again. And so the whole story is on the subjects of the whole universe and how our skies work and how the planets work. I think that the idea that there are 37 major gods, sun gods, and each have the same kind of a story, where they died the, the, you know, and were resurrected, and they had a virgin birth. It seems to imply that there was some sort of an ancient, really, truly ancient culture that developed this idea and this story for the world, and therefore it has become known as the greatest story ever told, because it is, the, is in fact, the greatest story ever told. I think that we have uh, been on this earth, we humans, the way we live today, we've been on this earth with other life forms, other higher and far more intelligent and creative life forms that we really haven't looked at very closely and haven't really thought much about it. But when you do that kind of research into the things which are found on the earth that we can't explain, pyramids, on the floor of the ocean and great temples in, in the Pacific and in the Atlantic Ocean and the pyramids of Egypt and all of the wondrous, uh, you know, beautiful structures of the ancient and prehistoric world. There are just too many indications that there's a higher civilization that has been on this earth than we are, far higher. They understood the universe far better than we do even today. And so the Aztec, Mayas, the Incas, the Toltec peoples, the Egyptians, Babylonians, Sumerians, all of these ancient cultures were far, far smarter than we are. We've been learning from them. Our numerical system uh, comes from Babylon. Our understanding of uh, our religions and the concepts in our religions come from Egypt, come from the Hindus, the ancient Hindus. So I am totally convinced uh, as many other researchers and writers on the subject, that we are not as wonderful as we think we are, but there were far more uh, uh, civilizations that were far more uh, adept at science and, and taught us today. They taught us. I believe that we're being uh, manipulated even today by what we call government and governmental officials. But if you look at the history going back 6,000 years, it seems as though there's always been an overshadowing intelligence behind our evolution and our uh, destiny. Someone as smarter than we are has been guiding us. The idea that we have been uh, created by a higher form of life, a higher civilization has created us. Uh, it implies that they, in creating us, have purposely uh, not given us full potential because you don't do that with a, with a new experiment. Uh, you, you just bring it along little by little and guide it the way you want it to, de to develop. And so we don't have the wherewithal, intellectually speaking, uh, to break away from the, the masters who have created this earth 
and, and, and seem to feel that they own us and that they can control us. We don't really have the wherewithal. And I think the reason why is because knowledge is power. And if you don't understand some of this hidden, uh, hidden knowledge and hidden history of who we are and how we've got here, if you don't understand that, you're never going to understand why we don't have the power that we could have if we joined together. Well, it tells us something about our Creator by looking at ourselves. Because if our Creator was, was like us, and, 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 and we are in that image and likeness, then there are many good people who are working to help the human family and help to educate and to protect. There are good um, extraterrestrial life forms here who want to see us progress, but they also are, are aware that we should not become too smart because if we become too smart and too clever, uh, we may be presenting more trouble for everyone else out there in the universe because we're already talking about going out to the stars and setting up new civilizations on other planets. But the, but the extraterrestrials look at us and think, wait a minute, you're talking about coming out to the stars and setting up new civilizations like the one you've got on Earth today? I don't think so. And you're going to bring that out into the universe? You better think about that. I think the bottom line on this is that there are two sides to the story. There are some good uh, extraterrestrials, aliens, and there are some who are evil. Same thing can be said for the human family. But that doesn't mean everyone's bad. It just means the ones who are bad are, are more vocal and you see what they're doing. Because of the conditions that the world that we live in today exhibits, that there is a dark force in this world that tends to cause man uh, heart, heartache and tragedy. And I think, this is just my opinion, but I think that the reason why there is so much uh, a movement toward I and me and I want what I want, I think all of that is part of the frustration of the human family that realizes it's capable of so much more but that the powers that be over us keep us down. They won't let you. If you're too smart, you know, you, you're going to be in trouble. Government doesn't want you too smart unless you're working for uh, government. I think we were, when we were being created, we were being created with a, some kind of an inborn or hardwired uh, complex in us that we want to look to something higher. We want to look to a father. We want to have a mother and father, and they take care of us, and they make all the decisions for us so we can just go out and play and have fun as children uh, because we have the authorities who take care of us. And so I think that that stays with uh, the human race because all we are today, all the adults on the earth today are just grown up children. Most adults think like children. They don't have an education of a, of a really well-informed adult. And so I think that that's the problem, is that our makers, and whoever they were, uh, want to keep us ignorant because that way you, they can control you better. I mean, when you start getting too smart, you start asking the wrong kind of questions. And now you're going to be in trouble because now you, as an investigative reporter, you're starting to look at things going on in this world that you're not supposed to talk about. The best way to control people is to keep them frightened and confused. Because if the humanity, even the Bible said basically that if the human race were to ever put down its arms and stop fighting each other and join together and use their minds and use their spirits that they would be invincible, that they would be an incredible civilization on this earth of extraordinarily brilliant creatures, human beings. And so to keep that from happening, because if we get too smart, our creators or those who think that they own us and control us 
will have bigger problems trying to control us. So they keep us ignorant and ill-informed and unread and fighting among ourselves like children. That keeps us out of their way. So that they, they don't do what we do. They don't fight each other. Originally, there was ancient religion, but it wasn't Hebrew or Jewish. Going back to the Middle East, we find that it was probably more the Egyptian than it was Jewish. But the Jewish people, or what we call the Jewish people back then, at that time, the dominating worship at the time in Egypt and the whole Middle East was the worship of the moon. The moon worship was very important. The uh, Egyptians especially put a lot of importance on the worship of the moon. Well, the moon god, if you were in Egypt and you're looking east, in the middle of the Sinai Desert is an enormously high mountain range. And so the people on the Egyptian side of the Sinai would look eastward and every evening, about six o'clock, the moon would come up from the mountain. The moon became known as the old man of the mountain. And the moon name, the, the old man's name was Sin. S-I-N was the name of a moon god to the ancient world in the Middle East. And the mountain was Ai, so you put the two together, Sin and Ai, because Mount Sinai. Well, that's where Mount Sinai is said to be, is in the Sinai Desert. And this is why the Hebrews today, as they did many hundreds of years ago, they have a lunar calendar based on the moon. They trace their beginnings of each day from sundown to sundown. Why? Because that's when the, that's when the moon comes out, is from sundown to sundown. First of all was the moon. Later on, Jupiter comes into the picture in, in ancient Hebrew worship. Jupiter, because in the ancient world, pater, P-A-T-A-R, or P-A-T-E-R. And in the Phoenician Canaanite language, it was a pitter, P-I-T-E-R. The ancient name for the Jews was I-U in the King's English, the old King's English for the word Jew. It wasn't spelled uh, J-E-W, it was spelled I-U or I-O-U. So I-U was Jew and Pater was the father. So it became known as the father of the Jews was I-U Pater, where I's and J's are interchangeable. So now it becomes J-U Pater or Jupiter. Jupiter now becomes very important in the Jewish religion. And then from the changing of the astrological age of Aries, uh, from blowing the ram's horn to Pisces, you now move into the Christian age. Today, we have a, in the Vatican, we have a, a statue of St. Peter. No, it's not Peter, it's Pater, Father God, Pater. And you put J-U in front of it, it goes Jupiter. So now that we have the, the technology today that we have, uh, where we can talk to the world uh, through the, 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 the system of technology, we can now begin to show the whole world where all of this has come from, all of these ideas and concepts and gods and sun gods have come from. We're now able to do that with the technology we have today. So, so many people today are now beginning to see that their ancient and highly venerated religions are merely part of a world continuation of a same story, the greatest story ever told. Sun worship is a very old religion dating back thousands of years before the Roman Empire. But in Rome, the sun god was called Mithra. Mithraism was the main religion in the Roman Empire at the time that Christianity was coming into, uh, coming into play in the Roman Empire. Emperor Constantine was a follower of Mithra 
And Mithra uh, was God's son who died on a cross. He was dead for three days and rose again. The Emperor Constantine was famous for starting the, the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church was not started by Jesus. It was started by a Roman emperor. And it was, and it was headquarters in Rome, not the heaven. <laughs> it was mixing Judaism and Mithraism and some of the other religions of the, of the uh, Arabic world that also worshiped the sun and brought all of these different religions together in order to confirm the power of Caesar in Rome under one religion and one government. To, it was a, actually a world government, supposedly, at the time. This is a Sumerian picturing uh, the sun on the altar. In the ancient world, uh, the Phoenician, Canaanites, Sumerians, uh, the Hittites, all of these ancient cultures always uh, had helmets. Their military wore helmets with the rising sun symbol. The rising sun symbol is still used even today around the world on helmets and military. Here in Rome, you'll see the Romans wearing the rising sun. Again, you will see it here where the Romans, they were brutal rulers of the people, but their symbol was the rising sun. And so now let's look at the sun worship today and its ancient foundation, which was the cult of Solus Invictus. Solus Invictus is Sol, which is the sun, and invincible. The sun was said by the Romans, it was invincible. Why was the sun invincible? Because every year it came into its power in, in the summer, and then it would die in the winter to the, to the northern uh, hemisphere. But it would come back every year. It would come back to the northern hemisphere. So it may die in the winter, but it's coming back. It's invincible. You can't keep it down. And so we see today the, the pictures of Saul, and he's the sun riding across the sky. The sun was pictured in Rome as uh, riding on a chariot across heaven. And so the sun was that lucky old sun ri riding around heaven all day, roaming around heaven all day, on a, on, obviously on a chariot. And here is Solus Invicti, or uh, this is a picture of Mithra, and it shows us the sun spokes, the sun rays around his head, the sun god of Rome. Now, in the doctoral theses, there's a very important book called The Cult of Solus Invictus. And in it, it, it shows you all of the connections with the Roman government, the Roman religion, the Roman commerce, the entire state of Rome and the ancient Roman Empire was all based on the sun. And you'll see like the sun cult uh, up to the first century of the empire, the political background of it, the establishment of the cult of Solus Invicti, the dogma, the teachings of the ancient the religion, Dysolus Invictus is the true Roman sun god. Of course, the Roman sun worship can be traced back to the ancient Egyptian sun, sun god, Amun Ra. So Amun Ra was, we, say, we use the word today, R-A-Y, Ra, sun Ra. But the ancient Egyptians called their god Ra, of which that's where Ra comes from. So it was called the cult of Ra, or the cult of the sun Ray. And so here is Amun Ray, the official name of the sun god in Egypt. Amun Ray, A-M-E-N hyphen R-A. Here's Amun Ray again. Now, when you see Amun Ray, the Egyptian sun god was the supreme god of the universe, as, car, as, as, a, as said by the Egyptians. But what is important to remember is that Amun Ra uh, today in our supposed modern day world and our Christian church, both Catholic and Protestant, they refuse to give up the old pagan sun cult of Amun Ra. And so today, this is why when you pray to God, you end up by saying amen, because you're sending your prayer through God's son, Amun Ra. The Catholic Church is replete with all kinds of sun symbols. You'll always see the Pope wearing large sun symbols. It's on his hand, it's on his uh, gloves. 
It's on the outside of churches. It's at the top of churches also, implying the sun is risen and uh, the sun rays are dominating the, uh, the Catholic Church all over the world. So here is uh, paintings on the, on the wall of the Vatican showing the angels, or showing the, the worker, the common man, the worker, to look to the sun for his food and for his life and for everything. God's Son is the light of the world. And so Catholic Church or the Vatican is promoting sun worship. Everywhere the Catholic Church and Christians meet, you will see the sun. This is a convention held in the United States for the Pope and, and, and to honor the Pope and to honor the Catholic presence in America. But you will see that there is a sun in the middle representing Christianity. God's Son, the light of the world. The Savior is born. Here are pictures from uh, modern day uh, you know, magazines of Christians. The Savior is born. Is there a child? You see a child there? No, you see the Son. And so the Son is always golden. So the little the Son of God has the spokes of the, of the uh, ancient uh, cross behind his head. You will see as he's always pictured as a blonde or the sun baby. And here's the mother uh, holding her son. And here in the Vatican is a very interesting uh, a picture of, this is a sculptor in the Vatican. And it is showing Jesus' mother, the Virgin, which is Virgo, the Virgin of the Zodiac, holding her newborn son, S-U-N. And this is in the Vatican. Both baby Jesus and the grown-up Jesus are trying to show you what it's all symbolizing. It's symbolizing sun worship. Here you have the baby Jesus showing you the sun. Here are the sun worship in the Jerusalem temple, the uh, ancient Hebrews worshiping the sun. Today we have the Pope uh, uh, you know, all over the world carrying the sun symbol for the sun. This is not a man on a cross. This is obviously sun worship. And you will see the sun everywhere here, the Pope. This is what is being promoted throughout the world as Christianity, but which is in fact sun worship. Now the ancient Egyptians pictured the, the sun had wings. And uh, we see it, 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 the sun is rolling across heaven the sun in, in India and the Hindu worship of the sun. Now here we have the Inca priest kneeling on an altar and, and offering up the wine in the altar to the sun god. The same you will see in Japan, you'll see in England, they're singing praises in a hymn to the rising sun, the wood carving uh, picture of the Jews and, and worshiping the sun. And here again is the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they are writing about their savior, the sun. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is spring, summer, autumn, winter. The four seasons are, are symbolically represented by four gospels. This is a very important book showing that the sun in the church today Cathedrals are solar observatories. Now, of course, in, in India, the most important sun god in India was Krishna. Uh, we know that the Jesuits, when they went into India back in the 1500s, they learned very quickly the whole religion of God's son, the light of the world in India, who was Krishna. And they came back and infiltrated those teachings and concepts into what we call Christianity. This is the work of the church borrowing the stories from the ancient world of sun gods who died on the cross. Now here is an ancient Babylonian king, and his name was Shemesh. And he was a Babylonian sun king. And you'll see the altar in front of him has the sun. But this is very important, a Babylonian king being worshipped and his name was Shemesh. 
It's because in the Hebrew language or in the Jews, Shemesh is the sun in the Jewish language. It has to do with exactly what it's showing, sun worship. And today we're still doing the same thing. We're worshiping the sun. And you will see the sun is prominent in all of Catholicism. Everywhere you look at Catholicism are worshipers of the sun. Now here we have a picture of Jesus giving to the children a part of his body. And what is he giving them? A little round sun disc. We're told that we should all take part of his body at the First Communion. In that communion in the Catholic Church, you're taking part of God's son's body. The whole idea is very obvious what's being talked about here. We're just talking about sun worship. You will see Moses in, in pictures and paintings and sculptings. Moses has horns. And it's been a, a row, all around the world. People have wondered, why is it Moses? He has horns. And it's, it's uh, interesting to understand what the horns represent on Moses. The horns of Moses, and you will see that there was a, in the ancient world, at Moses' time, in that ancient time, there was a moon god, and the moon god's name was Sin, and he was always represented by the lower quarter of the moon. And so the lower quarter of the moon was used as a symbol for moon worship, and they had goddesses of moon worship, which you have. Also, in Rome, you had moon gods. You know, the American Native Americans also have horns because they counted their days by many moons. Their days were like the Hebrews today. After six o'clock began a new day. It was the same thing with the Native Americans. So all of these people from the ancient Hebrews to the Native Americans were using a lunar calendar. Lunar simply meaning the moon, and so the symbol for the lunar was the horns of the bull, or the horns that which the Vikings used. This is a symbol for the lunar symbol, which you'll find everywhere in different religions. These are the, these are the horns that Moses wore. Here in Israel, you'll see um, you'll see carvings of the arms raised to raise and to praise the moon, and Egyptian paintings show the moon. The Blessed Mother in Christianity stands on the moon. You'll see the moon um, everywhere in the ancient world of religion, which was showing us that the moon was very important, even at the time of Moses in Egypt. Moon worship was very prominent. And of course today, the, the Islamic world still uses the moon also. And, uh, and in the Western world, the moon is still used as a symbol. We're talking about a moon cult many thousands of years ago in Egypt, of which Moses was the leader of the Hebrew people, which were worshipers of the moon at that time. If you go on the web and just put in, uh, just type in moon god sin, it will have all kinds of information showing you about how the moon was a very important part of worship in the ancient world. And they, they, they will also tell you that Moses was a leader of a lunar cult. It, there's a lot of information about the, the moon cult and the moon god, Yahweh or Allah. Here is a classic example in the ancient world of the, the moon god Sin. The god himself, was, his name was called Sin. And, and in the ancient world, Ai was a mountain in the times of ancient Egypt. Ai was a mountain. And so we have this moon god, Sin, on his, in, his, in the mountain, Ai, and put it together and becomes Sinai. So Mount Sinai is actually, no, the moon god, Sin, in the mountain of Sinai. Well, Mount Sinai today is, is felt to be the center for and the, and the really foundation for the Jewish religion as it began to spread throughout the Middle East. Mount Sinai was where God met, met with Moses. God met with the, his people at Mount Sinai. But Mount Sinai is actually Sin Ai. It was just one of many reference works. This is by Andrew 
K from the uh, from the Southern Methodist University. His article is Traces of the Worship of the Moon God Sin Among the Early Israelites. The Jewish tradition uh, talks about the combination of the heavenly moon as a part of the a most important part of the Jewish worship at that time. There are many symbols and, and emblems and paintings showing Moses in relation to the moon. And so here is uh, pictures of a priest lighting a fire to signal a new moon. Here you will see an illustration of the Israelites and their worship of the moon, the prayer to the new moon. And below you will see sanctification of the new moon. This is from Amsterdam as far back as 1723, showing the importance still in the worship of Israel for the new moon, or for the moon. Above, you will see the new moon etching from a, from a book back in 1748 showing the Jews celebrating the new moon. Today, the new, new moon is still very important around the world to many cultures. And here we have a picture of Egypt and the Sinai. And down the, toward the bottom of the Sinai, there was a huge mountain range. And so here we see the, a better picture where Mount Sinai is referred to in the area of the wilderness of Sin. And Sin, of course, is the moon god. Sin is originally the moon god of the Arabic world. Allah and Sin and, and, and Moses with, uh, with Yahweh, it all had to do with the worship of the, of the moon god, Sin. And for some reason, the ancient Arabic world placed a very high respect on the moon. It's probably based on uh, some phenomena that the, that the new moon caused because the Arabic world and the ancient world in general realized that the moon has a huge effect on our bodies, it has an effect on our uh, food supply, and it pulls the oceans of the world. And So the moon was very important to the ancient world. I mean, that is a whole study in itself why the uh, ancient Arabic world had such a reverence for the moon. They always used the moon to keep the track of days because their days started at sundown, at six o'clock. Because why? Because that's when the moon comes out. While the Christians were worshiping and, and having their holidays and, and important times in, in their religion, on Sunday they were worshiping uh, on you know, worshiping the son of God, the ancient Arabic world and the ancient Hebrews were under the influence of the moon god. The Christians, as you know, have a sun calendar, and their days start with the, with, from sun to sun, while the Hebrews and the ancient Arabic world had a lunar calendar, which uh, counts their days from sundown to sundown. The moon, as it comes up, and it was referred to as the lunar god who lived in the mountain and the real Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai itself was understood to be a volcano. And this is why when Moses goes up into the Mount Sinai to get the, uh, uh, the new Ten Commandments from God, he is confronted by the mountain is on fire. And so anytime you have a mountain on fire, that happens if you have a volcano. And so Mount Sinai was known and is even today uh, uh, recognized as being uh, probably connected to volcano worship also. And so this is why Moses goes up and he sees the mountain on fire and he talks to God. And the scriptures, even in the, New, in the Old Testament, the Bible says, that the, uh, that the ancient Hebrews were frightened when they would hear the thunder in the mountain because they said thunder was a word uh, we call thunder, but the ancient Hebrews said it was the voice of God. He's talking to them, and he had lightning, and that was trying to get their attention. So God was very angry and very uh, upset with the Jewish people because it was like a mountain on fire. Well, of course, we're talking about a volcano. So Moses becomes important in volcano worship also. Here you will see Moses pictures. These are all pictures from Christian and Jewish publications showing Moses going up into the mountain, and it appears to be a volcano. Well, that's because it was a volcano. 
here we have some a Jewish publication showing the children of Israel running away when they hear God thundering in the mountain. It looks like a volcano. All of the pictures of Moses going up into the mountain to get the Ten Commandments always shows the mountain on fire. All right, so here we have Moses preparing to go up to the mountain uh, to get the new Ten Commandments from God, and that appears to be a volcano. Here is a particular uh, religious celebration. It's called the Feast of the Giving of the Law. And in the Hebrew reference works, you look up the, uh, the celebration of the Feast of the Giving of the Law, and what do you see but a volcano? So the word volcano comes from a Latin volcano god called Vulcan or Vulcanus. It's derived from an old Christian deity, Vulcanus. Here is the old volcano god Vulcan. And it was always because the people were frightened to death at the thunder and the lightning that was caused by the volcano. And they thought it was God talking to them. And so then we talk about Prometheus, uh, was another ancient god about the time, was also a volcano god who was worshipped and took him to Greece, while Yahweh was a volcano god who the worshippers took him back to Judah. And this is again why Moses encountered God in the burning bush, and it seems there's not only the burning bush, the home.